Hi folks, Chris McClure here. We uh, move to section 6.8 today where we will look at applications of the uh, exponential function where we'll take a look at uh, exponential models for the, the growth of certain quantities like for example populations or sales or money. Well, we've already talked about money. Newton's law, where we uh, take a look at how the temperature of an object that is within a bath or a room will change, and its rate of change is going to be dependent somehow on the difference between the temperature of the object and the ambient temperature. Finally, we'll take a look at the logistic growth slash decay uh, models which give a more realistic uh, pattern of growth for a population or other things that you'll see as you'll see in the example all right so moving along here to look take a look at the law of uninhibited growth is nothing more then where you have this exponential function where you have an initial quantity a sub zero times e raised to some a constant k times variable t and if k is positive then you're going to have uh, this positive exponential growth but if k is negative then you're going to have this what we call decays sort of growth uh, uh, or a change it's not growth it's uh, it's going to be um, where the quantity of of stuff is going to be decreasing with time according to this model but um, the t axis will be a uh, Well, it, you know, the as T becomes large, the quantity will never, you know, get below zero. So the T, T axis actually acts as a vertical asymptote. Excuse me, I was trying to think of the word asymptote. All right, so moving along here, uninhibited growth of cells is where you have this exponential growth of cells where you start off with n sub zero as the beginning population and k is a positive constant that represents the growth rate of cells k is the growth rate and the number of cells as a function of time t was given by n sub zero times e to the kt where k is positive we would expect for k to be positive anyway because if you put you know n sub zero cells could be five could be 20 could be 30,000 whatever cells in a culture and give it some time that quantity of cells is going to do nothing but increase right so let's take a look at our first example here suppose that we've got a colony of bacteria that grows according to the law of uninhibited growth according to this function n of t is equal to 90 times e to the 0.05 t where n is measured in grams so not the number but actually the the mass of bacteria and t is measured in days so we're going to answer these questions first we're going to determine the initial amount of bacteria we are going to determine the growth rate of the bacteria what's the population of five after five days how long will it take for the population to reach 140 uh, well could be cells or it could be grams what is the doubling time for the population now I let's go back up here I think that where n is measured in terms of the number of cells not in grams okay unless each cell is one gram 
Anyway, so let's try to answer the first question. What's the initial uh, amount of bacteria? Well, you determine that just by looking at this uh, multiplier or coefficient of 90 for the function. And it's going to be 90 because when you set t equal to 0, as in at the very beginning when no time has passed, the, the number of cells is going to be 90 times e to the 0 0.05 times 0. And 0 0.05 times 0 is 0, e to the 0 is 1. So you have 90 times 1, which is 90. So the initial population will be 90 cells. Part B. Well, the growth rate is given by that multiplier of t in the exponent. And that's going to be 0 0.05 as a decimal or 5% as a, well, as a percent. Part C. What is the population after five days? So evaluate the function with t equals 5. You plug in 5 for t. 0 0.05 times 5 is 0 0.25. e to the 0 0.25 times 90. That's 116. That's something that you could do on your calculator. And of course, this won't give you an exact integer. But you'll get your decimal number around it to the nearest uh, integer. Because it doesn't make sense to have a fractional number of cells. Part D. To answer the question, how long will it take for the population to reach 140 cells? Well, you could set the number in to be equal to 140. So the function is equal to 140. And then you do a little bit of algebra to solve for t. Divide both sides by 90. Take natural log of both sides. Divide both sides by 0 0.05. And that works out to be approximately 8.8 .8 days. Part E of the problem, what is the doubling time for the population? Well, the doubling time will be the amount of time it takes to go from the initial quantity to 180. Or to take uh, any other quantity, say for example 100, the, the amount of time it takes to go from 100 to 200. To, to make it easy, we'll just set the number to be equal to 180, which is twice the initial quantity, and then solve for t. So go through that process. Now 180 over 90 is 2. And so you have natural log of 2 is equal to 0.05t. And then divide, divide both sides by 0.05. And that works out to be about 13.9 days. That's the doubling time. So to go from 1,000 to 2,000 cells, that's about 13.9 days. To go from 20,000 to 40,000 cells, that's about 13.9 days. Okay. Moving along here. Now, let's take a look at the second example. A colony of bacteria increases according to the law of uninhibited growth. So we know what the form of the function is going to look like. We're going to still use capital N. N is going to be the number of cells. And T is the time in hours. Express N as a function of T. So there we go. There's the form of our uh, function where we have the law of uninhibited growth. Part B. If the number of bacteria doubles in two hours, find the function that gives the number of cells in the culture. So what we could do is we could set N to be equal to twice the initial quantity in sub-zero. And then solve, oh, and set T to be equal to 2 because the population is going to go from n sub 0 to 2 times n sub 0 in 2 hours. And then divide both sides by n sub 0, and you have 2 is equal to e to the 2k. Take natural log of both sides, divide by 2, and that means that k is approximately 0.3465736. So now you could have this uh, function as you see it here. Plug that number in for k. How long will it take for the size of the colony to triple? 
will set n to be equal to 3 times the initial quantity n sub 0 and go through and solve for t that you see here. Works out to be 3.2 hours. Now, how long will it take for the population to double a second time? That means it increased by four times. Well, because of the fact that it doubles in two hours, it's going to double again in four hours. Right? <laughs> so, all right. Find equations that populations that obey the law of decay. Well, it's going to be the same as the law for an inhibited growth, except k is going to be negative. K is going to be a negative, and A sub 0 is the initial quantity. Take a look at this first example here. Traces of burned wood along with ancient stone, stone tools in an archaeological dig in Chile were found to contain approximately 1.67% of the original amount of carbon-14. Now, carbon-14 is radioactive a uh, variant of the carbon atom. If the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,700 years, as determined by chemists, approximately when was the tree cut and burned? So let's take a look how to solve this problem. Now we're going to go ahead and write, you know, the fact that your amount A is equal to some initial quantity a sub 0 times e to the k t okay and then a is going to be equal to one half a sub 0 when we're talking about half-life and you're going to have half-life when 5600 years pass so you set t equal to 5600 now let's solve for k divide both sides by a sub 0 take natural log of both sides divide both sides by 5,600. So you have natural log of 1 half, which by the way is negative natural log of 2, divided by 5,600. And that's going to be approximately equal to negative 0.000124. So now you can write your equation. Um, in which that you have A of T is equal to A sub 0 E to the K well, k is equal to negative 0 0.00124 times t. Now, to answer this question, uh, you know, in which the fossils, in this case traces of burned wood, contain 1.67% of the original amount. So what we could do is we could set a of t to be equal to 1.67% of a sub 0, with you have to write that 1.67 as a decimal, so 0 0.0167 times the initial quantity a sub 0, whatever that is. Divide both sides by a sub 0, take natural log of both sides, divide both sides by negative 0 0.000124, and that works out to be about 33,003 years. So, if we are going to use carbon dating, to um, estimate how old these ancient stone tools were, well, according to our math here, that would work out to be about 33,000 years. Moving along here. Now, Newton's law of cooling uh, is of this form where U is the temperature of a heated object so think about pulling out a roast from the oven and putting it on the countertop in the kitchen now that roast is going to cool with time until it eventually reaches the same temperature as the, the ambient temperature of the kitchen Now, U is the temperature of the roast, or the heated object, at a given time, T, can be modeled by the following function. Well, U is the temperature of the object, T, this capital T here, is the temperature of the uh, area, of the room, of the bath, or whatever, it's the ambient temperature. 
Now, U sub zero is the initial temperature of the object. It's the temperature of that roast when we pull it out of the oven, which is probably the temperature of the oven itself. <laughs> so you have U sub zero minus T times E to the KT. And whenever the object uh, in question is hotter than the ambient temperature, then K is going to be negative because, after all, the object's temperature is going to be decreasing. Now, we could also look at a variant of this problem in which you pull something out of the freezer and put it on the counter and its temperature is going to increase with time. So K would be positive in that case. Okay, so moving along here, let's see if we could tackle this problem. We have a cake that's heated to 350 degrees Fahrenheit, is then allowed to cool in a room whose air temperature is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So mu sub zero is 350, Big T is 70. Let's look at part A of the problem here. If the temperature of the cake is 300 degrees Fahrenheit after 5 minutes. By the way, they've just given us enough information to solve for K. Then when will this temperature be 200 degrees Fahrenheit? So there's the form of our uh, function here. We plugged in 70 for uh, big T and 350 for u sub zero and then we're going to use this piece of information that at five minutes the temperature is 300 degrees so we plugged in five for t and 300 for u and if we do a little bit of algebra to solve for k and it works out that k is approximately negative point zero three nine three four two Go back to our original equation. By the way, 350 minus 70 is 280. Let's answer the question. When will its temperature be 200? So we could uh, replace U by 200 and solve for T. And it works out that T is approximately 19.5 minutes, as you can see here. Sequence of steps to solve for T. Uh, we have a couple more p uh, parts of this problem. Part uh, B, determine the elapsed time before the temperature of the cake is 100 degrees. So we could set U to be equal to 100 and go through and solve for T. That you can see there. Part C, what do you notice about the temperature as time passes? Well, Looking at this uh, equation, you know that as time gets larger and larger, the exponential function will become smaller and smaller. So that means that the overall function is also going to become smaller and smaller. And as t becomes rather large, as in several hours passing, um, this exponential function times 280 will become essentially zero. So that tells us that as, you know, time passes, the temperature of the cake will become closer and closer to the room temperature of 70 degrees. Logistic model. The, the big problem with the uninhibited growth is that you know, that's not going to last for very long. What you could do is you could take a huge container like a big 55 gallon container fill it with you know a, a lot of growth medium put a single bacterium in that agar or whatever that growth medium is and seal off that 55 gallon barrel now that single bacterium is going to split in two and each one of those bacterium or bacteria will split in two and so forth and those cells are going to grow 
exponentially, at least for a while, until they start running out of room and other resources. But as their, as the capacity of their little ecosystem reaches its maximum uh, for, you know, supporting that life, uh, the growth is going to actually slow down and stop once all the resources have been used up. That's more realistic instead of the uninhibited growth, which doesn't make sense in the long run. For, for the short run, yeah. So we have this logistic model, which is more realistic, where we have population P as a function of time T, where you have some constant C divided by the quantity 1 plus some other constant A times E to the negative BT, where B is yet another constant. Well, now we're going to assume here that C and A are both positive. And the, the model is a growth model if B is positive or a decay model if B is negative. So if the population is increasing with time, then B is going to be positive. If the population is decreasing with time, then B is going to be negative. So far, so good, right? Here's just kind of a generic graph, graph of a generic uh, logistic model. Where you have this kind of uh, nice smooth continuous function here uh, we're assuming we have positive growth for this example here notice that to the left the population uh, goes towards zero the t-axis is a horizontal asymptote and that as time becomes large the population uh, levels off and gets closer and closer to a horizontal asymptote of y equals c. Remember c is this um, constant in the numerator of the logistic model function. Notice here we have this point on the graph in which the graph transitions from being concave up to concave down. And that point is called an inflection point. It, that kind of marks the point in which the population's rate of growth starts decreasing. And it turns out that inflection point is going to happen when uh, the population is equal to one half times c. You can kind of think about C as uh, kind of like a carrying capacity if we're talking about a population of animals or plants in an ecosystem, for example. It's kind of like the maximum quantity that that uh, system can hold for those individuals in the long run. Now, if we have a decay sort of model, then it's just kind of the opposite of what we were looking at on the left. And with time, the population will uh, approach zero. But as t goes to the left uh, in negative time, then population is closer to c. Let's go through these properties of the logistic growth function. First of all, the domain is the set of all real numbers. And if you think about t as time, yeah, it is possible to think about t as being negative. After all, we think about t being equal to zero as, you know, some given time, maybe some arbitrary starting time when t equals zero. For example, January 1st, the year 2000. Well, so t being negative, that's the time that 
uh, is before that mark. And this population function here, this logistic growth function, is going to be um, defined for all values of t. Now the range of this function will be where t is, excuse me, p is between 0 and c. The population is going to be between 0 and c. Never quite reaching 0, never quite reaching c. We think about c as the carrying capacity. This top number there. There are no x-intercepts. There are two horizontal asymptotes. Uh, 0 and C. The y-intercept is going to be at t equals 0. So P of 0 is the y-intercept. When the constant B, this, gro this growth factor, B, when B is positive, then the function is an increasing function and decreasing when B is negative. We already talked about the inflection point. The graph is smooth and continuous, no, no corners or gaps. It's a nice, beautiful, continuous function. Let's look at this example for the fruit flies. We have fruit flies are placed in a half pint milk bottle with a banana for food and yeast plants. And we also think about the yeast plants as food for the flies and it would also provide stimulus for the flies to lay eggs. Suppose that the fruit fly population after t number of days is given by this this model right here. So you could already pick off 230 as the carrying capacity. After all you know, when you let T become really large, this piece right here, this 56.5 times E to the negative 0.37 T, when T becomes large, this will get closer to zero. So the whole denominator will get closer to one. So the population will get closer to 230. So that's what tells you that 230 is the carrying capacity. Now, in to answer the question, what is the growth rate? Well, you look at the, the coefficient for t in the exponent. And that's going to be uh, negative 0.37. You take the absolute value of that, and that works out to be 37%. So 37% is the growth rate. To answer part b, determine the initial population. That's going to happen when t is equal to 0. So replace t by 0. Now e to the 0 power is 1. So you have 56.5 plus 1, which is 57.5. 230 divided by 57.5 is 4. So that corresponds to there being 4 fruit flies that get put in the half pint milk bottle at time 0. In this case, day 0. Let's answer the question, what is the population after 5 days? We'll replace by, uh, t by 5 in this function here. And this is the sort of thing that you're going to want to use your calculator for. So just evaluate this function to t equals 5. And that works out to be about 23 fruit flies. Uh, part D, how long does it take for the population to reach 180? Well, you, you're going to set P equal to 180. So do a little bit of algebra to solve for T. Multiply both sides of the equation by the denominator. Multiply that out. Maybe divide both sides by 180. You know, well, 230 divided by 180 is that's the 1.2778. Subtract 1 from both sides, divide both sides by the 56.5, and then take natural log of both sides, divide both sides by negative 0.37. That works out to be about 14.4 days. 
So if you want to calculate how long it takes for the population to reach any amount, then set the function equal to equal to that amount, equal to that population, and then go through and algebraically solve for t, like you see here in this sequence of steps. And if you wanted to, you could use a graphing utility, as in your graphing calculator, uh, to determine how long it takes for the population to reach one half of the carrying capacity by graphing. Uh, well, you could plug in the function, this function right here, for y sub 1 in your graphing calculator. And then for y sub 2, well, that would be one half the carrying capacity. One half of 230 is 115. And then this is kind of what it looks like. Where this uh, curve right here, that's the graph of this function, the population function. And then the horizontal line is the graph of y equals 115. And then you hit the intersect button. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out my graphing calculator and show you how to do this. So bear with me just for a couple seconds here. I'm going to go into my equation editor here. I'm going to clear both of these functions out. And then I'm going to go back to the first y, uh, function, y sub 1, plug in 230, divided by quantity 1 plus 56.5 times, and you don't need to explicitly put in the times, e to the negative 0.37x and then I'm going to hit the right arrow to get out of that exponent and then parentheses uh, and then enter and then we'll plug in 115 for y sub 2 enter and for my window, um, we can let time go from 0, enter, to, I don't know, I don't know, we can maybe go out to 50, enter, we'll tick mark every 5 units, y minimum 0, y maximum 230, which is the carrying capacity, and then, excuse me, um, we actually need to set y minimum to be 0, my apologies, y maximum 230, and then tick mark maybe every, you know, 25 or so units. And then hit graph. And then we could try to find the coordinates of this point right here. And we do that just by going into your calculate menu. And hit option 5. And we're going to go ahead and press enter uh, to select those two curves. And then the guess will be closer to maybe about 10 days. So I could use my cur cursor with my arrow buttons or I could just plug in a value for X. That's somewhat reasonable. And you see that the intersection is going to happen at 10.9, as in 10.9 days for X.
Okay, so there we go. So going back to our presentation here. All right. I'll let you do the exploration on your own. Let's look at our last example for this uh, section. We'll go ahead and read through this together. The Epheson wood product model classifies wood products according to their lifespan. There are four classifications. Short, as in one year. Medium short, four years. Medium long, 16 years. And long, 50 years. As in, if you have something made from this wood, how long can you expect for that uh, product to last? Well, and that classification is going to be in one of these four um, uh, well, classifications. Based on data obtained from the European Forest Institute, the percentage of remaining wood products after T years for wood products with long lifespans, long as in 50 years, such as those used in the building industry, is given by this function. So it's a logistic function. Notice that B is negative here, so that means that this is going to be a decay sort of function. What's the decay rate? Well, it's going to be this number here. This value for, uh, well, B. What's well, actually absolute value of this number, this multiplier for T. And write it as a decimal, 5.81%. Part B, what is the percentage of remaining wood products after 10 years? By the way, capital P here for this function is percent. What, what is the percentage of remaining wood products after 10 years? Well, replace T by 10, evaluate the function at T equals 10, and that works out to be 95, as in 95%. So 95% of the wood products remain after 10 years. How long does it take for the percentage of remaining wood products to reach 50%? So you could set P to be equal to 50 and solve for T, kind of like how we did in the previous example. A little bit of algebra lets you look at those steps, practice them on your own. That works out to be about 59.6 years. So suppose that we have a bunch of different products manufactured with this wood. We would expect that 50% of the objects remain, excuse me, uh, after 59.6 years have passed. As we should expect from the fact that uh, this wood is classified as a long lifespan. Now let's look at part D. Explain why the numerator given in the model is reasonable. Well, because of the fact that we think about the numerator as the carrying capacity. And if we were to, because of the fact this is a decay model, we can let T go toward negative infinity. In which case this little factor here would go toward zero. And you'd have 100.3952. Now... In reality, uh, this should be 100, but this there's a, a little fudge factor of 0.3952 in order to make the model work out. But this is at least reasonable because we would think that the percentage of, you know, wood products can never be more than 100%, right? <laughs> All right, so moving along here, that is it for today. Uh, tomorrow I'll post uh, our very last uh, video together from the material on section 6.9. Okay? And that will be our last bit of material for the course. And then we'll start talking about the uh, final exam. All the homework is posted through section 6.9 
on my math lab. And hopefully everybody, everyone's had the chance to take the midterm exam. All right. All right, take care, folks. Good luck, and I'll see you next time.